Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. i got to take my shoes off. Hang on. I didn't know if I was going to need to do that, but I got up here and I felt it, so they're off. Um, my name's Amanda. I am a recovering alcoholic. By the grace of God, I'm sober today. Um, I say that because it truly is by the grace of God and the people in these rooms. And I don't know about y'all, but I've already been crying and we ain't even got started yet. <laughs> what a wonderful fellowship you have here. What a wonderful group. Um, I want to thank the committee um, and Larry for asking us to come. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to be asked to serve in this way. I love walking in and seeing faces that I know, faces that I love. Um, I feel like I'm coming home. Uh, and I'm just so thankful, so thankful to be here tonight. Um, I am a recovering alcoholic. My sobriety date is May 19th, 1991. My, I live in Montgomery, Alabama. My home group, home group is the Happy Hour Group. We have painted on our wall. We are not a glum lot. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. Page 132. There's a plaque on the wall that says happy hour is not a time of day. It is a state of mind. And I try to live my life every day as a happy hour, a happy minute, a happy five minutes. Being grateful. Being grateful to be one of the chosen ones. My sponsor used to say, when we look around these rooms, we're the lucky ones. We're the chosen ones. We're the ones who were chosen to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. We're the lucky ones. And I'm so glad that I decided to stay until the miracle happened. I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon, and my name is Angie. Hi. My home group is the Level Plains Al-Anon Family Group in Level Plains, Alabama. And I also attend the uh, Noon Fun Group in Dothan, Alabama on Wednesdays. I, too, want to echo what Amanda said. Thank you so much for asking us to come here and speak tonight. And, and I really, I just have to say, surely the presence of God is in this place. And my prayer for all of us tonight is that we're going to feel his touch before we walk out these doors. Um, I'm probably going to shed a tear or two. I want, I want you to know if there are any al in the room that I've got some Kleenex right here and I'm going to be fine. Um, <clears throat> I used to, I used to uh, you know, worry about crying and worry about the tears and having a little snot in my nose. And this lady came up to me one night and she said, Honey, you cry prettier than anybody I've ever seen, so I don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> I, will have, I have to tell you that um, the people that I have loved most for my entire life could attend AA or could attend Al-Anon. I have many friends who do attend AA and who do attend Al-Anon. I have almost no family who does. And there's not a branch on my family tree that doesn't have alcoholism in it. Now, I didn't know that until I was in my late 20s. When I grew up in my family, my mother was an alcoholic. I had a number of relatives who were uh, heavy drinkers. And, you know, when growing up in that home, it was just home. It was just my family. And I didn't know that my family was any different from anybody else's family. And my family was like other families in that there was a lot of joy, there were a lot of fun times, there was a lot of happiness, and there was a lot of tragedy, and there was a lot of sadness, and there was a lot of trauma. And that's the family I grew up in. My father was in the military, we traveled a lot. Uh, he uh, did his military profession, my mother was a homemaker, she stayed at home. I have one brother who's six years older than I am. And as I grew up in that family, this is kind of the... the type of child I was. I was either really, really good or really, really bad. I tried to be perfect. I was the perfect daughter, the perfect student, the perfect everything. Because you see, I didn't want you to see the terrible person that I knew I had to be on the inside. Because I knew there had to be something I was doing that was causing the things that, that, that were happening in my family. And I knew if I could just find that magic thing to make those things quit, everything was going to be okay. So that was one way I was. The other way I was, I just showed you the terrible, awful person that I knew I was. 
And that's pretty much how I lived my life. Two extremes of behavior uh, for much of my life until I walked into the doors of al -Anon. As I was growing up, of course, you know, there came a time in my life when the opposite sex, opposite sex became attractive to me. And I will tell you the kind of uh, person that is attractive to me. Uh, if, a, if we were in a room with no alcoholics in it, except one, for me, the minute I walked up to this podium and looked out, a spotlight would have turned on and would have shined on that one alcoholic person. You see, I've been in love with alcoholics since I was born because my mother was alcoholic. And I'm going to love alcoholics until I die. I am convinced of that today. But what I've tried to do today is what my sponsor shared with me one time. She said, well, Angie, can't you just try to love the ones that are in recovery? So I'm, I'm trying to learn to do that. All right, so the spotlight would shine on that young man, and this is the kind of fellow he would be. Fun. Likes to have a good time. The life of the party. Likes to drive fast cars, might like to jump out of airplanes, loves to dance, can tell a good joke. When you walk in the room, everybody knows he's there and everybody wants to be around him because they feel good when they're around him. A lot of fun. Doesn't know how to handle anger. Has been abused probably uh, at least physically, verbally, maybe sexually when he was growing up. Doesn't have a clue about any emotion much except anger. And you know, it was only a year or two ago that I realized one day when I was talking about the kind of person that I was attracted to, I realized I was really talking about myself. Because that's who I was. Didn't have a clue about feelings. Didn't have a clue about handle, how to handle many emotions except anger. Had experienced a lot of trauma. And you see, that wounded heart of mine would be attracted to that wounded heart of his. And we would join hands together and we would march off into the sunset to make a perfect life. And it never worked. It never worked. And he would beat himself up about that and I would beat myself up about that. And then I would leave him and guess what? The spotlight would shine on another. And I would try to fix, try to fix the other relationship with the new relationship. Over and over and over. Doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. I was very blessed with, the, with uh, my marriage to Amanda's dad because out of, out of that marriage did come a beautiful daughter. I've never been at a loss for words. I just got to tell you, I'm just humbled. I'm just humbled by being here this evening. And just in case you didn't know, I took my shoes off because I feel like this is holy ground. Um, okay, so here I come. You know, I'm born. Much like most of you. <laughs> and you know, just like, just probably like any other alcoholic, I felt different. You know, I've heard a lot of speakers. Um, and, and I've talked to a lot of alcoholics, and to a man and a woman, I've never met one that did not feel different for some reason or another. Now, I will tell you, um, sometimes Mama and I get, when we're praying and meditating when we go to speak somewhere, sometimes we get a little blur. God will give us a little something-something to get us going. Um, and I can tell you that I got nothing for today until I got here. And the first thing was that I was not supposed to tell my blonde joke because this is serious, and this is serious business. And to me, it's life or death. And I'm just enjoying being in the fellowship of the Spirit. The other thing I got was, I'm not supposed to go into a big drunk along. You've been to speakers. You've been to meetings. Let me tell you, it's not a whole lot different. I'll give you some of the highlights. Um, I felt different from the time I was born. Um, there were a couple of reasons why I felt different. The first one was I was um, not raised with my real father. Um, my grandparents and my mother raised me. Uh, when I was eight years old, my mother left and went to college, and my grandparents raised me. And uh, things kind of rocked on until I got around 12, and things started getting interesting. Now, I would like to say that my first drink was when I was 12, but that would not be the truth. I can't tell you when my first drink was, but I remember what it was, and that was my granddaddy's scuffling wine. Ooh-wee. He made homemade scuffling wine, my great granddaddy. And uh, at Christmas time, uh, all of our family would get together, all the aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody, and we would each get one little plastic champagne glass of that scuffling wine. And that stuff tasted fine to me. 
Little did I know, you know, years down the road, that I would want to taste something like that again. Uh, Twelve was a hard age for me. Um, I'll share with you three things that happened. The first thing that happened was, um, you know, Mom had been gone for about four years. She would come home on weekends or whatever. We would see each other. Um, but Meemaw did a lot of my raising. Now, Meemaw was from the old school. Now, today she would have been put in jail by DHR. <laughs> Back then, we didn't have no 911. <laughs> and so when we got in trouble, we had to go outside and pick a switch off that rose bush. And if it didn't have the right length and the right <laughs> to it, she would go pick one. And Lord help you if she had to go pick one. So, you know, that's, that was that part of Meemaw. So one day we got confused and, and miscommunicated about where she was supposed to pick me up. So here I am, I'm at the front of the school, waiting on Mima to come get me. Mima's not here. Oh, Lord, where's Mima? Because, you know, my life was like I'd get in the car and change into my dance clothes and go to dance or go to band practice and come home later and do homework and eat supper and go to bed. I mean, I was the quintessential overachiever. So two and a half hours later, she finally finds me. And we get home, and I got the worst beating I ever had, and uh, blood was running down my legs. And Mama came home. I called Mama, and she told me, Mom, she said, you will never beat my child like that again. And she didn't. But a seed had already been planted in my head. You see, that day I learned to CYA. I was going to do whatever it took to not get beat like that ever again. It didn't matter if I had to lie. It didn't matter if I had to tell the truth. I was not going to get beat like that ever again. I was already in survival mode. Second thing that happened that year um, was, you know, me, Mom, and Peepa living with them. It got interesting at times. And uh, I would get up in the middle of the night and want to drink a water. And I'd go out of my bedroom and get in the hallway, and there's me, Mom, and Peepa arguing in their underwear, uh, in their door frame. You know, so I had seen them fight. So um, one day me and Peepa was fishing. I'm originally from Andalusia, Alabama. Lived five miles outside of town. Peepa had a, Meemaw had a pond, and uh, across the street ain't open up. Peepa had a pond, and I love to go fishing. I love it. You can take me today. So we're out there fishing one afternoon, and, and somehow we got on the subject of Meemaw and Peepa fussing. And I said, well, why don't you just get a divorce? Mama's done it, you know, not thinking anything else about it. I don't know how much longer it was. I come home and Peepaw's sitting at his spot on the table and uh, Meemaw's in her in her chair and I can tell something's going on. So I come in and Peepaw says, come here, I want you to sit on my lap. So I go over there and I sit on his lap and he said, you know, do you remember that conversation that me and you had on the pond about me and Peepaw, I mean me and Meemaw arguing? And I said, yes, sir, I remember. And he says, uh, well, do you remember what you said? And I said, well, yes, sir. I said, why don't you just get a divorce? And he said, well, we are. Now, my 12-year-old mind, it was all my fault that me, Mom, and Peepaw were getting a divorce. You see, if I had not said it out loud, it wouldn't be true. If I had not planted the seed in his head, me, Mom, and Peepaw would still be married today. And he wouldn't be running around on her best friend. And he wouldn't be building that house that me, Mom, could see right out her kitchen window right across the pond. None of that would have happened. The third thing that happened that year... Mama had always told me that when I was 12, if I wanted to, I could go find my real father. And I wanted to. You know, so many of us talk about the hole, the hole I had in my soul. You know, and that was one of the things that made me feel different. So maybe if I find out who my real father is, maybe that will help fill up that hole that I have. Maybe that will help heal the hurt that I have. Maybe that will right all the wrongs in my life. Maybe that will help me sleep at night. I don't know. But, yes, I want to go find my real father. Now, I had one picture of my daddy, and it was them on their wedding day. And there's my mama all pretty in her white gown, you know, and and there's this handsome six-foot-five gentleman, really skinny. They called him Slim. One blue eye, one green eye, uh, crew-cut, real clean-cut hair, handsome man. I could see why she married him. And um, that was the only picture I had of my father. So I tell her, yes, I want to go find him. So she calls up his parents' house in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Yes, he's still living there. That should have been clue number one right there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's still living there, y'all. Come on. So me and Mama and my favorite aunt traips off to Spring Hill, Tennessee. Um, and we go down that little Kedron country road, and, and we 
You go up the big curve, and there's this big, beautiful house sitting on top of a mountain. Gorgeous. We get there probably around lunchtime, knock on the door. Grandma answers. She's probably in her best nightgown. Um, she answers the door. And then here comes my uh, grandpa, um, six foot six, as wide as the door frame, uh, white hair, big burly man, KKK card get- carrying, NRA president, um, hillbilly, Tennessee of a man. That was grandpa. So we sit down in the front room, and, and I'm looking at all the uh, lockers of guns that are in there. Now, maybe I need to tell you, Peepaw was military, so I grew up knowing to be seen and not heard, which fork to use, how to act out in public. Uh, we went to the American Legion. We played bingo on Friday night, and everybody in my little hometown all looked like me, acted like me. Everybody was the same. So this was the first time I'd ever come in contact with these kind of people. So we're sitting there visiting with Grandma and Grandpa, and I hear this noise. And I had never heard that noise before in my life. Today I know it was a motorcycle. And it starts coming up the driveway. You know that Harley, 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 Harley sound. <laughs> and, and the only way I know to describe it was there was a woolly booger sitting on the Harley. <laughs> And it gets off the Harley, and it's about six foot five, and it's got a beard down to its belly button. It's got hair down to its butt. He's covered in tattoos. This one has the F word. I had never even heard it, let alone seen it on somebody's skin. And it comes in the door, and it says, well, aren't you going to hug your old man? Well, no, no. This is, this is one year of my life, and I had many, many that were very typical to this. I graduated high school when I was 16 years old on June the 4th. On June the 7th, Amanda's dad and I got married. On June the 15th, I turned 17. I got pregnant in July. We separated in December. We divorced in February, and Amanda was born in May. <laughs> one year. I had many years like that. I thrived on the adrenaline, I thrived on the drama, I thrived on the chaos. I didn't realize that at the time. If you had asked me, I would have told you that I would do anything to make my life be different. But I did thrive on that, if I'm being totally honest today, and my program teaches me that I have to be. Um, My second husband was drunk when I met him, drunk when I married him, drunk when I lived with him, and drunk when I divorced him. I I have never seen him sober to this day. (laughs) My third husband did not drink. So that marriage didn't last very long at all. (laughs) Quite dull, quite boring. But you know what? When we got divorced, he started drinking. (laughs) He looked a whole lot better, so I remarried him. (laughs) We did have more fun, I must say, but that marriage did not last. (laughs) Thankfully for me and a lot of unsuspecting men in America... In 1978, I was living in Andalusia. Uh, my pattern kind of was, if I wasn't with a man, I was back home with mom and dad. Because, see, I was going to be around alcoholics. I was going to be around them. So I was living in Andalusia, Alabama in 1978, and I was in a play, and I played the lady of the evening in the play, and there was a man that played the villain in the play, and, of course, you know what he was. Well, we went out on a date, and the second date he said to me, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I'm going to an AA meeting. Would you like to go with me? And, of course, I said, sure. So the week rocks on, and my mother says, uh, I I asked my mother, can she babysit a man? She says, yes. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, what is an AA meeting? And I said, well, I don't know, but, you know, AAA is all about cars, so I'm thinking it must be something about cars. So he picks me up, and we go to a little town outside of Andalusia, Alabama, called Red Level, Alabama, which is about a fifth the size of Andalusia. And we pull up in front of this building that I know today is a, is a place called First Step Recovery Treatment Center. It was an alcohol treatment center. And there was a big, old-looking bus sitting over there. And he said, I'm going to go inside. You go get on that bus, and I'll, and I'll be out in a few minutes, and we'll, and we'll go. And I said, okay. So I go hop on the bus. And I'm sitting there, you know, wondering what kind of cars we're going to talk about and what we're going to do. And about that time, these men start coming out of this building. And they're a little bit unkept. Okay? (laughs) One comes, and they start getting on the bus. One, and then three, and then four, and then there's seven, and then there's twelve. 
And I'm sitting here thinking, Angie, 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 you have done it again, honey. You're going off with a man. You don't know where you're going or what you're going to do when you get there. And here you are. And that's what happened. Paul got out and came on that bus and cranked it up, and here we took off. I had no idea where I was going. But, you know, that's kind of the way my life was. I lived a life of fear. I was afraid of being perfect, and I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of living, and I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of you discovering that I wasn't the perfect person that I was showing you that I was, that I wasn't the fixer, that I didn't have all the answers. But I was also afraid for you to see who I really was, the wounded, precious child of God I was on the inside. And, you know, for me, when I get really scared, I'm not much of a fighter but I'm a really good runner. So I would run. Well, here I am on this bus with these, with these 17 men, and I can't run. So we go about 15 miles outside of Andalusia to a town called Op, and we get to town, and thank the Lord, we pull into a church parking lot. I have never been so glad to see a church in my life. <laughs> so we park the bus, and everybody gets off, and we all go inside, and Paul says, me and the guys are going over to this room, and you're going to go to this room over here. So I said, okay, and there was a lady standing in the doorway named Miss Anna. And I can see her today as good as I see you sitting there right now. She was precious. She had black kind of grayish hair, and it was all done on top of her head, and she had glasses on that string thing you wear around your neck, and she had on a, on a blue dress about, about the color of my, of my jacket. She was precious. And she grabbed my hand, and she said, honey, you come with me. And we went in and sat down. I can't tell you one thing that was said that night in 1978. I cannot tell you one thing. But I can tell you that I felt love and that I felt like I had come home. That's what I felt that night. When I started to leave that night, she gave me this Allen on one at a time book. I never saw her again. But what an impact she had on my life. And that's one thing I would, I hope that you'll leave here with tonight. We are all having an impact on somebody's life by being in recovery. We never know. A simple word we might say, a touch we might give, a hug we might share, we never know what part of a miracle we are. You see, I didn't really feel like I belonged in Alan because I didn't think I knew anybody that was alcoholic. Remember, I just lived in my family and things happened that happened in families. So I didn't have a clue. I did keep going to Al-Anon some in Andalusia. I kind of went on and off for a number of years. Um, but I wasn't really sure that I really fit in even there. I just wasn't sure. One of my life mottos is there's a reason and a purpose for everything. And if it had not been for that man taking her to that meeting when I was around seven or eight years old, I wouldn't be here today, all those years later. So, needless to say, I told you that 12 year was rough. My best friend, um, Daddy, took us all down to the beach, down to Panama City, and uh, he went around and took everybody's drink, uh, drink order. And I said, well, yeah, I think I'll have a six-pack pe- six of peach wine coolers. Drank every last one of them. And I remember sleeping like a rock. I remember that taste, that sweet taste, and I remember being able to sleep. So many nights I would stay up worrying, worrying about Mama, worrying about Mima, worrying about Peepa, worrying about my life, worrying about this, worrying about that, wanting to get out of the skin that I was in. Am I going to be okay? How am I going to survive? All that stuff. And when I drank that alcohol, buddy, I passed out. And the next day, you know, I had a good night's sleep, and, and it's on. Now, I didn't start drinking every day right then. You know, this is a subtle foe. It's sneaky. Life rocks on. But I knew where the liquor cabinet, or the liquor was kept in my Mima's house. You know, for years, they, like I said, they were military, and uh, we had an entertaining household. And all people's war buddies, and all the, any time the family would come in, Mima would get over there in front of that sink, and she'd start doing her little dip dance. That right there. Now, she would pull out these plastic glasses that you couldn't see in, and it didn't take me long to figure out that she was getting liquor from under the cabinet. And she's pulling up, making toddies for everybody. And when that dip dance would start, buddy, everybody would start laughing and having a good time. And Uncle MC would start telling his jokes. And Aunt Muck would start telling her jokes. And a lot of my favorite relatives were probably drunks, you know, and, and they would have a good time. So I knew where to go get it. So there would be times when um, me and Mama and Mima would be sitting there at the kitchen table, and, and they think I've got a bottle of Sprite sitting there with them. 
visiting and talking. And what they don't know is I had went in there earlier and got that 151 Bacardi rum and had poured out my Sprite and filled it up with rum. So I was sitting there getting my drink on, visiting with them. Um, like I said, I'm from the country. There were field parties. Um, I was in the van. We'd all go riding from Hardy's to McDonald's on Friday night after the game. That's all we got, the stretch from Hardy's to McDonald's, about two and a half miles. <laughs> Every now and then we'd get a wild hair and go down to the TGNY parking lot, but you had to be careful about that because kids were present home and red level over there and they were wild. Um, so, you know, life rocks on. My dream had always been to go to the University of Alabama and play in the Million Dollar Band, um, and I was able to do that. Uh, I think I might have went to two or three classes that first semester uh, because when you get the Million Dollar Band together, that is 450 of your new best friends, and anywhere we go is a party. I mean, literally, I remember um, we had our own plane going to Tempe, Arizona for the Fiesta Bowl. And everybody's passing bottles back and forth. And I can remember being on, when we were packing for that trip, I don't remember worrying about what clothes I was taking. I remember worrying about my bottle of peach schnapps and my bottle of 151. How well do I need to pack it so it can make it there? So that I can have something. Because you see, I wasn't legal yet. I wasn't legal yet. Never been carded. Never been kicked out of somewhere. Well, trying to get in. Um, so life rocks on. I, uh, I dropped out that first semester. And my mama says, you're coming home. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. I'm staying right here. I got me a job working at a four-star restaurant that had a bar in it. Um, and I was a waitress for a little while. But, you know, when you're trying to get your drinking career on, carrying them trays just gets a little hazardous. And uh, I, I became the hostess. I planned it out everybody's schedule and stuff. I would go over there in the bar. A lot of times the only food I would eat would be the happy hour food. Uh, got all the free drinks I wanted. Um, February 19th, 1991, my world was rocked. Absolutely rocked. See, growing up in that little town, growing up Southern Baptist, um, my great-grandmother, my big mama, was a very important part of my life. You see, it didn't matter if I made a C in school. It didn't matter what was going on with me, Mom and Peepaw. It didn't matter what was going on with my mama. I could go to Big Mama, and she would love me unconditionally. Unconditionally. And I can remember going to church with her. And I remember thinking on the way to her funeral, you know, I heard in church that it's a sin to even think it, that I'm going to go to hell for just thinking it. So by God, let me see how fast I can get there. The next three months of my life were a blur. I don't remember a lot. I remember bits and pieces. I know that I was in blackouts, but it took me a lot of years, a couple of years in recovery to really get honest about that because my version of that was I would pass out. But my friends would tell me, you know, um, things that I would do. My grandmother remembers me calling her in the middle of the night wanting want her to sell some land um, and give me the money. Um, I can remember waking up in the middle of McFarland Avenue and my friend grabbing me by the feet, pulling me out of the road because I have decided to lay down and take a nap in front of oncoming traffic. Um, I remember driving drunk many a night, many a night. Um, it's only by the grace of God that I'm still here today. I did all the things that we do. I was doing all the things that I had been taught a lady does not do. A lady doesn't go in a bar and she's got a cigarette in this hand and a beer in this hand and do number two all in her pants and continue to stand there listening to the band, getting my drink on. A lady doesn't go to a bar with only a few dollars in her pocket um, thinking she's only going to have one or two drinks, have the one or two drinks, thinking, well, what in the world was the point of that, and start talking to the cute guy next to me and being manipulating and conniving and using my feminine wiles that I'm very good at it. Because I'm a survivor. I learned how to survive. I learned how to get what I wanted. I learned how to get what I needed. I used men. Uh, I used women. Whatever I had to do to get that next drink. I don't know when my body changed. I don't know when I crossed that line, but I know I crossed it. You know, you would buy me a few beers. You'd probably get lucky. You'd probably be able to take me home. But you might not get me all the way to the bed because a lot of times I would wake up in stairwells with my head hanging over trash cans covered in puke and pee and blood and whatever else was on there. There's a lot of that I don't remember, but the parts that I do remember were awful. You know, Mama talked about 
wanting to die and not wanting to die and being a precious child of God and all of that. I was all those things. I was terrified. I was terrified. I knew I couldn't keep living the way I was living. But God, I didn't like the way I was living. And I was trying to drink myself to death. You know, I'm a coward. I was too scared to use needles. Um, I really didn't like that. Now, I might huff something, and I might smoke a little wacky tobacco, um, but alcohol was what I had to have every day. Um, and if I woke up somewhere and I couldn't get a real beer or liquor or whatever, uh, I might do the Listerine. I might get your perfume. I might raid your medicine cabinet and try to find the NyQuil. I had to have something every day. That three months went on. You know, one of the parts of my disease is I love to spend money. And um, I was the first great-grandchild, the first grandchild, and the only child. So you might say I was spoiled a little bit. And I didn't really understand that just because you had checks in the checkbook didn't always mean that the money was there. <laughs> so part of my drinking career, you know, in Tuscaloosa was to write bad checks. I'd wake up with a hangover or feeling bad or feeling guilty or whatever. And, and get a little bit in me, and here we'd go to the mall. And I might take a friend, and I might buy her a whole new bedroom suit, or I might buy myself a whole new wardrobe, or buy a round of drinks at the bar, or whatever, whatever, trying to change the way I feel. Um, well, I had noticed that my mailbox was getting really full of these long, brown, official-looking documents, and some of them would say some word around police, and some of it would say federal government. Well, I choose to ignore those envelopes, and I would just open the letters that my mama was writing me. So one day I get in from being out all night. Uh, the only thing in my refrigerator is raw cookie dough and cherry Kool-Aid. I can't keep anything down. Drinking pretty much around the clock. And I hear this knock at my door. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's the police. Well, now, I am nosy by nature, and i got to know who it is. So I go to the door, and I listen. I stick my ear to it, and I can hear voices. I hear women's voices. And I look through the peephole, and uh, they leave. They leave. So I really can't tell who it is. That's just not good enough for me. So I open up the door, and it's my mama's best friend. And she turns around, and she says, Angie, she's here. She's here. And my mama and her best friend walked in my apartment. That three months uh, that Amanda kind of spun out of control, I didn't hear from her during that time. And, and my two best friends kept saying, what are you going to do about Amanda? What are you going to do about Amanda? And I remember saying, I will know what to do about Amanda when God tells me what to do. And they were just baffled that, that I wasn't doing anything. But I woke up one morning and I said, today's the day. And I called them. I said, will you go to Tuscaloosa with me? They said, yeah. And we went to Tuscaloosa. And on the way, my best friend said, what are we going to do when we get there? And I said, God's going to let us know what to do when we get there. You know, there have been some times in my life that if I am truly willing and truly trusting and truly where I need to be in my spiritual life, there are times that God will use me in ways that I never imagined that, that he would use me. And I have to say that just about that whole day was, was one of those days. We got to Tuscaloosa and we, we got to Amanda's apartment. We got out of the car. Uh, there were there were a row of mailboxes there for the people that lived in that apartment complex, and there was mail all over the ground. I mean, all over the ground was mail. And we went over there and we started looking at it, and it was mail to Amanda. So I said, we need to get this mail up. So we got a, a garbage bag out of, the, out of the car, and we put up, got just gathered up all those envelopes and put them in that garbage bag. And then, of course, we went to the door and knocked, and there wasn't an answer. So one of the friends and I were going to get the landlord to get him to open up the apartment when my other friend told me that Amanda was there. And I remember walking in the apartment, and I remember just hugging her so tight. And I remember saying to her, Amanda, it's going to be okay. It is going to be okay. We walked in, we sat down, we chatted a little bit, and here came God. And God said through me, Amanda, I'm here to make you an offer for this day on I think it's a pretty good offer. I will do whatever it takes. I will pay whatever I have to pay. We'll go wherever we've got to go to get you whatever help you need for this day only. If you decide you don't want that offer, that's okay too. We'll go out to lunch. We'll have a great lunch. We'll visit. We'll have fun. And then I'm going to go on back to Dothan and you'll be here. And I'm going to give you one hour to make up your mind. 
And I got up to leave, and Amanda asked one of my friends to stay there with her, and the other friend and I, we went to the mall in Tuscaloosa. And for that hour, we walked up and down that mall, me just sobbing like a baby, because I knew she wasn't going to take that offer. And my friend, she said, what are you going to do if she does? And I said, I don't have any idea. But I said, you know what? God does know. God does know what I'll do if she accepts that offer. But I said, but I know she's not going to. And I just sobbed and sobbed. We got back to the apartment, we walked in, I said, okay. And she said, I'll accept the offer. And I said, okay. And you know, I, I know a lot of people that do a lot of things in the state of Alabama, but I knew a lady that was a therapist in Fairhope, Alabama, and I picked up the phone and I called her, and I said, my, and this was on a Saturday, and I said, I got her on the phone, and I said, my daughter's got a problem. And she said, what is it? And I said, I don't know, but she's written a few bad checks. And so she said, well, Angie, maybe she's got a mental illness. And so I thought, Maybe she does, and we can get her some medicine and some therapy, and she'll be fine. So we talked on a little bit, and she said, I'll call you back in a few minutes. So I said, okay. So we're in, we're in Tuscaloosa, which is in the northern part of Alabama. And she calls me back in a few minutes. She said, I need for you to have her at Providence Hospital in Mobile, Alabama, which is way south. At 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to put her on the psychiatric unit. And I said, okay. So I hung up the phone, and I said, Amanda, we're going to Mobile, Alabama. We're going to be there at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to the hospital. And I said, let's go get a U-Haul it because we're going to pack up this apartment right now. We went and got a U-Haul. We packed up apartment. And, and my friend uh, said, well, at least you don't have to worry about drugs or alcohol. I said, what are you talking about? She said, there is nothing in this apartment but raw cookie dough and Kool-Aid. She said, I'm checking everything as we're packing it. I'm looking. She said, I'm shaking, shaking out clothes and everything. There's nothing here. So I said, okay. Well, at 9 o'clock the next morning, she and I were at Providence Hospital in Mobile, Alabama. She checked into the psychiatric unit where she stayed for the next two months. You know, we were, God blessed us in so many ways. This psychiatric unit in this hospital is, was one of the very few, probably in the country, that had a psychiatric unit on one side of that floor and an alcoholism and drug addiction treatment center on the other side of that floor. And you know that hospital is closed today. But you know what? It was open when we needed it to be open. And you know what else? Her psychiatrist was an alcoholic who was in recovery. How weird is that? There's a lot of psychiatrists that drink, but there's not a lot that are in recovery and go to AA. How cool was that? Every week I would go see Amanda. I would drive from Dothan to Mobile. It's got a four-hour drive. Every weekend I would go see her that two months. And every weekend I would go, it would be another bombshell that she would, that she would drop. And there were some serious bombshells that got dropped in that two months period of time. But I will tell you, the worst one for me was the day she told me that she was alcoholic. That was the worst bombshell of all. Driving home that day, I planned her funeral. I planned what she would wear. I picked out her casket. I planned who would speak and what they would say. I buried her that day on that way home, on my way home. And you know, I really did bury her. I buried the, the person that I imagined her to be. You know, I believe we all have uh, expectations of our children and we all have dreams of our children. And I will tell you, for me, I had to bury those and get rid of those before I could see the precious child of God that God had given me. That imaginary first astronaut on the moon and all that Oscar-winning actress had to get out of the way for me to see the precious child of God I have that has outlived every expectation I could have ever had. But I never would have seen her if I had not buried her that day. I got home, I walked into the apartment, I fell on my knees, and I took step one. I admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. And I started going to the Al-Anon group that I had been visiting some on a very regular basis. I've been a, a continuous member of that group for 22 years. I got a sponsor. And, you know, God is so good because the sponsor he gave me, her lineage in Al-Anon, started back with the lady that, that helped start Al-Anon in Texas. And in those days, all the literature they had was the big book. So I'm a big book baby. I was raised in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was told that those promises in that book were for me. And you know, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't believe that. Because what did I have? What did I have? I read Alan on literature. I, I worked Alan on literature steps that they had to offer. But those two things, that big book, good solid recovery that my sponsor sent me to, I will, I, nothing can replace that. I went to a lot of open meetings. I went to AA meetings. I went to Al-Anon meetings. I did everything my sponsor told me to do. 
So there I am in lockdown. I didn't know it was half whatever and half whatever. It was all locked down to me. <laughs> I was locked up on the 10th floor. The windows had bars on them. I could not open it and jump out. They had a key to get on the freaking elevator. I couldn't even go down another floor. Thank God for the caffeine Coke machine. I don't remember a lot about those first few days. Um, I know that I was in DTs, and I know they were probably giving me some good stuff. I remember um, hallucinating. I remember spiders, and I remember pink elephants. And they were not happy pink elephants. They were trying to kill me. And after about three days, you know, I had to come out and um, met my psychiatrist and saw where I was. And uh, a lot of stuff happened in treatment. And I'm going to share this really briefly because there are outside issues. Um, one of the things that happened to me in Alabama um, when, when I first got to college was I was raped. And I didn't remember that until I was in treatment. You know, they make you go through all these psychotic, psychiatric tests. And one of the tests was um, he was holding up cards with pictures on them. And I had to tell him the story of what was going on in the picture. And he held up a card, and it was... Um, a girl sitting on a bed and the man coming out of the shadows. And in that instant, I remember the night that I was raped um, and being handcuffed to the bed and my virginity being taken away from me. And that was a big deal for me because, you see, I was saving myself for marriage. I wanted to be different. Um, so while I was in treatment, I was able to work through that. And I'm so thankful that I was because, you know, I had a lot of anger at men. I was angry at my biological daddy. I was angry at Peepaw for cheating on me, my own, getting a divorce. Um, I was angry at men in general, and pretty much I, I didn't really need you. Um, you know, you were a tool for me. Um, but I was able to work through all of that while I was there. It was a bombshell just about every time Mama came. Um, while I was in there, they started going through two paper sacks of all those official-looking documents. Um, and I was looking at, with good behavior, 15 years at Julia Tutwala Prison, which is the women's prison in Wetumpka, Alabama. I was in that hospital for two months. Um, I made the mistake one day of telling my doctor that I might have drank a little bit, and he saw through that because he was in recovery, and he started sending my young buck to those AA meetings. Um, and I forgot to say my disclaimer at the front. I'll say it now. You know, when, when we go to speaker meetings, I really want to encourage you to hear the similarities. You know, a lot of time I would sit there in those chairs in the back of the room with my knees curled up against me, not wanting to shake your hand, not wanting to hug you, don't speak to me, you don't know me, you're old, you're crusty, you've been under a bridge, leave me alone. In, in my little alcoholic mind, I had a job at a restaurant that I was drinking at the bar. Um, I had a place to live that I had only paid the first month rent on. The landlord was feeling sorry for me and let me stay there. Um, you know, I had never had alcohol in my home. I had never drank alone. I was not the bum under the bridge yet. You know, all those differences. Um, and I wasn't like you. And one day they drug my young butt to a speaker meeting. And a lady got up there um, at the Alano Club in Mobile off of Airport Boulevard. And she got up there and she told my story. I mean, she told my story. Okay, well, she's telling my story and, and she has felt everything that I have felt and she's done things like I've done and, and she says she's sober. Well, what does that mean? She's really living without drinking? How in the world is she doing that? All this stuff starts going through my head. So that ride back to the hospital, um, the lockdown unit, was an interesting day for me. Um, I was 19 when I got in treatment. I turned 20. While I was in treatment, the day that I turned 20 was the day that I made fourth level and actually got to come down the elevator. And we went to Quincy's, and my birthday cake was a piece of strawberry cheesecake. That was my 20th birthday. Um, when I went back to that lockdown, I started talking to Jeannie, one of the one of the counselors there, because one of the things that I realized hearing that girl's story was there was hope. There was hope for me. She had done things like I had done. She was a drinker like me. She was female. She didn't live under a bridge. You know, all of that. And she was an alcoholic. Okay, so what does that mean for me? And, buddy, I started paying attention. I started listening to those meetings, and I started reading my big book. Um, because all of a sudden, the world opened up for me. Here's how it was presented to me. If you have cancer, 
and you're going to die of cancer. And you're told that if you take this little blue pill, that your cancer will be cured. It'll be gone. It'll be gone. Would you not be first in line to take that little blue pill? Buddy, I'd be knocking y'all down being first in line trying to take that little blue pill and get rid of my cancer. Here's what I know today. I have the disease of alcoholism, and this is my little blue pill. This is my textbook, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I take it every day. I started listening to what the winners were doing in the meetings, and they told me that I had to go to meetings, that I had to get a sponsor, um, that I had to read the big book, I had to read, uh, work the steps, all of this stuff. And I began to listen to what they were telling me. The day that I left treatment, I didn't know where I was going. Um, because, like I said, I was looking at 15 years in Julia Tutwiler. So I fully expected the day that Mama got me that that's where I would be going. We get in the parking lot, we get in the car, and she busts out with this big official-looking document. Uh-oh. It's a contract. And what it says is that Mama had went to every single place that I had wrote a bad check to. And she had paid back all that money. I think it was like $10,000. And what it said in this contract was that I had 10 years to pay that back or I would have to go finish serving my time in prison. Now let me tell you, that was a hard decision. Do I sign this contract and go live with my mama and try to get sober? Or do I go to where I know I'm going to get three hots in a pot and not have to make any hard decisions for a while? But that day, thank you, Lord, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself, and I got that pen and I signed that contract. And I'm going to share a quick story on that. You know, that was really terrifying to me to have to pay $10,000 back. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward for just a second. Um, I had about three years left, maybe two, to pay that money back. And I was worried. You know, new in sobriety, I had two or three jobs. I didn't have a car, but I had ways to get everywhere and, and try and do the right thing and live right. Well, I was in Montgomery, and uh, I had a car accident. And it was the other guy's fault. This big equipment truck had rolled backwards on me and uh, messed me up a little bit. And so we, we had a friend that was a lawyer, and, and that lawyer went to court and fought for me. And the, the check for the remainder, after paying the lawyers and everything else, was the money I had left to pay Mama back. See, that's how God works in my life. So... I signed the contract and moved to Dothan, Alabama. My first home group was Level Plains uh, Group, the Wildgrass Club over there. It's between Enterprise and Dothan on Highway 84. And I can still remember walking in that door and seeing every face sitting in their spot. You know, we have our spots like we like it. And there's, there's Fred and James and Joe and Mr. Bill sitting on the couch and Dottie and Darlene. And, and here was a little white-haired lady named Miss Peggy, and there was an empty seat. And there was a little blonde, beautiful lady named Gloria. And Miss Peggy said, come here, darling, you sit by me. This is your seat. And to my right was my first sponsor, and to my left was my grand sponsor. When Amanda got ready to leave the hospital and came to stay with me, I have to say that for me, that first year of her sobriety was, was a real roller coaster for me. I was going to Al-Anon meetings. I had learned in Al-Anon that, that there was no magic pill to fix her. I had learned in Al-Anon that I was sick, too. I did not like hearing that. Um, and I had learned that I needed to work a plug of recovery for the rest of my life. And I will tell you that I have done that the best that I could since the day I was told that information. And, and I hope the Lord's willing to let me continue to do that. Amanda had been living with me several months, and uh, as part of the contract, in, in that contract, for everything she agreed to do, I agreed to do something. Because you see, I, I can be a real martyr. You know, I can really get into this. Look what all I've done for you, and look what I'm doing for you, and how dare you treat me like that, and look what I've paid for you, and yada, 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 yada. You know, I can fight with my mouth if I can't fight with my fist. Okay, so I could be a real martyr, and I did not want to be that kind of person anymore. I did not like that part of me, and I did not want to be that way. So the contract was really as much for me as it was Amanda. There were things in it such as I agreed not to bring men home to spend the night. She agreed not to bring men home to spend the night. I agreed to let her use my car some because she didn't have a car. She agreed to keep it clean, to keep it washed and keep the inside of it clean. I agreed that she could live with me. She agreed that she would pay so much a month on the rent to stay there. Okay? So that was the contract. Well, she'd been with me several months, and I came home one day, and she, she was working 
probably six part-time jobs. And, you know, she didn't even have a car, but she had people lined up to come take her to work. I was just amazed. That's when I learned that my daughter is a survivor. I would be mortified to ask somebody to take me somewhere. As a matter of fact, one time I had a car accident, and I got the tow truck driver to take me to the airport where I could rent a car because I didn't want to call anybody to help me. Okay? She had people lined up to help her. That was good for me to see. It was really good for me to see. But anyway, I got home that day. She said, Mom, I've been working so hard. You know how hard I've been working, and I just don't think I'm going to be able to have all the rent for you tomorrow. And I said, well, that's okay, Amanda. I said, if you don't have the rent tomorrow, that's okay. But when I get home, you need to have all your stuff packed, and you need to be ready to move. Because, you see, I checked the Salvation Army before I let you come live with me, and they told me that they would give you two hots and a cot, and all I had to do was drop you off. So if you don't have the rent tomorrow, you'll be ready to leave. And I said, and I said, you need to take everything you want to keep because whatever you leave here is going to be mine. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to see you. I'm, we're still going to do things together and be happy together. But you won't live with me anymore. And man, her eyes were huge. Okay? So I went to the bathroom and got in the shower and I took a shower. And I mean, I cried. I cried and I cried because I knew I could do that. I knew I could do that. I knew I had gotten to a place where I had enough love and respect for my daughter to treat her just as I would treat any of you. And you know what? She deserved my love and respect. She deserved to have me treat her just the way I would treat any of you in this room if we had an agreement together and you broke it. But you see, I had never done that with her before. I had pampered her. I, I, I had let her believe she couldn't do things and that I could for whatever sweet reasons I had. But I knew that day that I was going to be able to, to drop off the Salvation Army and let her go. I got home the next day and the rent was on the table. And it was on the table every month until she left. You know, God, God's always with me, but sometimes he just has to show out a little bit. A man was in the hospital that two months and I never one time thought about the bill. And I'm, I'm a pretty responsible person. So I had, well, I just shocked me one day. Months later, I was sitting there and I thought, my gosh, I've never even thought about a hospital bill. So I called him up on the phone. And I will tell you that this, the, last, the husband I had when a man was in college, he had wanted to marry me pretty bad. And I really wasn't interested in being married. But he told me if I would marry him, he would pay for Amanda's college education. So you better believe I said, where is the preacher? <laughs> so we got married. Well, of course it didn't last, you know. But he had some really good insurance, and Amanda was on his insurance. So I, I didn't know all this at the time. I called the hospital, and I told him who I was. My daughter had been there. I said, I never have gotten a bill. Well, the lady said, oh, my goodness, we need to rectify that. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> so she goes away, you know, she stays gone for a long time. She comes back, and she says, well, Miss Bradley, that bill has been paid in full. And I said, there's no way it's paid in for us. And my daughter stayed there two months. She ate ice cream sandwiches, and she went on outings, and she was in the hospital for six, over 60 days. There's no way. You know, my, my insurance paid in full. She said, yes, ma'am, it did. She said, she said your, your husband's insurance paid it in full. And see, I thought God sent that man to me to pay for my daughter's college education. But he didn't do it. He said that man to me so that my daughter could have a, a new start in the world. With a clean slate. The bill was $58,000 and the balance was zero. That's how God will show up for me. Not every day, not all the time. But you know what? I hear story after story just like mine in these rooms. Just like that. My sponsor told me something that very first night that I'll never forget. And I shared in, in our meeting. She said, honey, she said, you never have to take another drink of alcohol ever again if you don't want to. And what I have learned in this program that in these books, there's some ifs. I have to be willing to go to any lengths. And I was willing to go to any length. I didn't want to die. I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to go back out there and drink anymore. I listened to what those old timers had to say. You know, we were talking earlier about alcoholism being a family disease. Mom and I would ride the 30 minutes to the clubhouse from Dothan. We'd sit there for 20 or 30 minutes visiting al and AAs alike. And then when it came time, the al would go off in their little room and we'd all stay in here. And uh, afterwards, we'd all have another 15 minutes. We'd go to roundups together. We'd go to conventions together. We went to area assembly together. 
them people took me under their wing. Mr. Bill Bailey, Lord, he had a, a big burgundy car. We called it the boat. And he would tell me, he'd say, all right, you'll be ready in 15 minutes. And I would say, yes, sir, and I would be ready in 15 minutes. And he would come and pick me up, and I never knew where we'd go. And we might be going to meet Enterprise. We might be going to meet Lozart. There might be five or six of us in there with him. It might just be me and him. I never knew. You know, my sponsor and my grand sponsor would get a room for area assembly. I never had to pay for anything. They took me everywhere, and I listened to what they had to say. And I was starving for this program because I didn't want to die. I worked the 12 steps with my sponsor. And um, and I'm I'm the strong. You gotta have a sponsor. You gotta read the big book. We went through the big book cover to cover. I was soaking it up every way I could. And then you know, things happen in recovery. First thing I want to share is that first year ain't easy. They don't tell you it's gonna be easy. They say it's a simple program. My first year was not easy. I don't know how many jobs I had. Um, and it was a chore to get rides to this work and that work. I mean, one job was even in another city. Um, I take anonymity very seriously. Uh, I was working at the Red Lobster, and next thing I know, the manager is pulling me in his office because one of the other waiters had seen me at an AA meeting. So I got fired because the guy had seen me in the AA meeting. Now, the part of that that I understand is he saw me there. How come he didn't lose his job? You know, I'm the one getting booted out. Um, it was a hard year. It was hard for me and Mama to learn how to communicate with each other. There'd be times she'd be sitting in her recliner, and I'd be sitting on the couch, and we would just be boo-hooing, sobbing, trying to talk about our feelings, trying to have a relationship, trying to live life and practice these principles in all our affairs. So we rocked on. I want to skip ahead a little bit. You know, that daddy was still on my heart. That woolly booger on that motorcycle was still on my heart. I will tell you that during my high school years and middle school years, I had tried to keep contact with him. Uh, we had went and visited him on a couple of occasions. I believe he was either drunk or high every time I saw him. I know he was high one night for the eight four boxes of the macaroni and cheese. He had the munchies in there. But he was on my heart, and I had about three years sober. Now I want to get into the phases of our development, as my sponsor calls them, our growth spurts that I think a lot of us have in recovery. Um, this first one is a miracle, and then I'll show my growth spurt. Let me show my growth spurt first. Show my growth spurt first. Okay. Um, so I'm about three, three and a half years sober, rocking along, got a good program, love my home group, you know, doing good, me and mama's doing good. Um, got my first little boyfriend in sobriety, you know, um, and I had a great job. Um, and so some of the girls from work wanted to go out dancing. Now, I love to dance, and I can kick it, and I can still do Roger Rabbit in six-inch stiletto heels. Um, that was my first major in college. I loved it. Well, they wanted to go out dancing. Well, you know, I got a little time under my belt. I go out with y'all on Friday night. Now, Friday night was one of my meeting nights, but I was going to miss it and go out with the girls. Missed that meeting, went out with the girls, had a ball. Second week came around, hey, Amanda, you want to go with me? Yeah, I'll go. Club called shenanigans down there. So this rocked on. Well, I began to miss that Friday meeting. Started not calling my sponsor as much. Didn't really know what she would think about me going out dancing with the girls because I had not told her that I was going out dancing with the girls. Here comes old sneaky snake, that subtle lie we're t- telling ourselves, you know. So I'm out there dancing one night, and I realized how easy it would be to pick up that beer off that table. Oh, I know it would taste good because I'm hot and sweaty. And they won't miss it. I'll just take it. The thought popped in my head, girl, you don't want to go there. I walked outside and I called my sponsor. And she met me at the clubhouse at 2 o'clock in the morning. And she talked me through it. She said, Amanda, you're at a crossroads. And I realized I was at the crossroads. And the big book talks about that. Here I am. I'm three and a half years sober. I'm only about 24 years old. I'm young. Am I really an alcoholic? Do I really believe that I have a disease? Now, I had been on 12-step calls. I really hate that some of our young people don't get to experience that today. Nothing will keep you sober for a little while than seeing someone else going through the DTs or puking up blood or having to go and buy a beer just so you can get them to the hospital or finding somebody laying outside covered in everything that we get covered in. That will keep you sober for a few minutes. She met me at the clubhouse. We're talking. I'm at the crossroads. Am I really an alcoholic? Do I really want to do this deal? I had a choice to make. And that night, thank you, Lord, I chose to stay in AA. 
to keep working with my sponsor, to stop going to the club with the girls. You know, they tell us, change your playmates, your playgrounds, your playthings. Do you know there's not a single person in my life today who knew me when I was drinking, who was my friend when I was drinking? They are no longer in my life. Not a single one of them. Not near one. And I wouldn't trade the friends I have today for anything. So there was that crossroad. The other thing that happened that year, uh, about third year sobriety, is, you know, my daddy's still on my heart. And I get the urge to go see him. I've prayed about it. I've talked to my sponsor about it. I know that I'm supposed to go see him. So I go up there. He's not drunk. He's not high. And we start taking a walk on their property. And it's a beautiful piece of property there in Tennessee. And, and you used to could see way far out. Now it's a bunch of houses because of the Saturn plant. But beautiful spot on top of this hill. And all of a sudden, I start telling my daddy about me being alcoholic. About everything that happened to me, about going to treatment, about going to meetings, my sponsor, how AA has changed my life. And I didn't know then that I was planting a seed, that God was using me that day. Um, but he was. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I've learned in this program is God often teaches me lessons that I need to learn. And I have to tell you that I, I used to be kind of hoity-toity about alcoholism. You know, I, I would say things like, I would certainly never give an alcoholic any beer or any liquor or anything like that, you know. And I, was, I, I kind of held myself a little bit above. And I have to say that, that God has dealt with my pride in a lot of areas. And uh, he certainly dealt with it in, in that way, in a way that I never expected. A man had talked to her dad, and a couple months later I got a phone call one day. And he said... Uh, you know, we're divorced, we hadn't had much contact in all these years. But he said, Angie, this is Slim. And he said, I'm coming today. And I knew when he said that, that he was coming to get sober. Because he knew that Tennessee was his stomping grounds and Duncan was our stomping grounds. And he knew that we didn't allow any drinking and we didn't have alcohol in our homes. He knew all those things. And I said, okay. And I hung up the phone and I called my sponsor and I said, a man's dad is coming to get sober. And I said, I don't have a clue what to do. And so here you got these two al trying to figure out how you give an alcoholic alcohol but get him sober, okay? So finally she said, I think we need to, she said, I think I need to talk to, her husband's name's Norm, she's, and he's been in recovery a long time. She said, I think I need to talk to Norm, I'll call you back. And I said, okay. So we're trying to figure out how to do this, and finally uh, uh, a friend in the program, an alcoholic in recovery, called and said, Angie, don't you know any doctors? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, call one of them and tell them what's going on. So I said, okay, so I did. So the doctor told me to go to the drugstore and get these pills and give them to him for three days when he got there, and that should take care of the, the detox. So about about 9 o'clock that night, I guess, I got another phone call from Amanda's dad, and he said, I'm in Clanton, Alabama, which is about two hours from Dothan. He said, I cannot, get it, I cannot come any further. And I said, I'll come pick you up. So I got my car, and I went to Clanton, Alabama, and I picked him up. And when he got in the car, he was throwing up blood. He was as gray as any dead person would be, and I really didn't know if he was going to live until we got back to Dothan, Alabama that night. He slung his duffel bag in the back seat, and he gets in the car. So I start driving, and I said, I said, you are coming to my house to get sober. And I said, and I know you've got alcohol in that duffel bag in that back seat. And I said, well, it's going to take us about an hour to get to Montgomery, and you have a decision to make, buddy. I said, when we get to Montgomery, you can keep that beer, and you can keep that duffel bag, and get out of the car, you can do whatever you want to do with it. But if you want to get sober, the beer's going to have to stay in Montgomery. We got to Montgomery, we stopped at Hardy's. I still go by there some when I go to Montgomery, and I just chuckle every time I go by there. We got up, he, got, he, said, he said, I'm coming to Dothan. I said, okay, you got to get rid of that beer. But then I got kind of scared, you know. I thought, oh, my Lord, what's the next to him? So I said, you can keep one beer and drink it on the way. <laughs> so he gets out of the car, and he's got this, this, these beers, you know. And I'm thinking he's going to throw it in the garbage can. See, I don't know much about alcoholism. Oh, no. He says, ain't nobody going to get this beer. So he opens each one up, and he pours it all into the garbage can. And I'm, you know, I'm just thinking, oh, Lord, please don't let anybody see me that knows me, you know. And I do want to say here, he has given us permission to share his, his story in the midst of our story. On the way to Dothan, I thought, what am I going to do when I get here? So I stopped at, the, at, a, at a grocery store, and I bought four gallons of orange Gatorade. He cannot drink orange Gatorade to this day. Yeah. Got into my apartment and started giving him those pills. But you see, I was scared of those pills, and I didn't want them to hurt him, so I really didn't give them to him like Kenny. So we had a pretty hard detox. 
And for three days, I had the privilege of know, of learning and experiencing the true disease that alcoholism is. I know today with every fiber of my being that any time an alcoholic anywhere in the world says, Honey, I love you and I'll never do it again. I know that that alcoholic means it with every fiber of their being. And I also know what a powerful, cunning, and baffling disease this is. And I know that most are not able to keep that promise. And it has nothing to do with love, but it has everything to do with what a powerful disease this is. I opened all the windows, I opened the doors, I, got, I had fans going. The reek of alcoholism that came out of his skin was just unimaginable. He told me during that three days that he, that he had wanted to get sober, but one time he'd been in jail and he'd gone into DTs. And he, he was calling treatment centers, and they were all telling him he had to be sober for 72 hours before he could get there. And he said, I know if I stay sober 72 hours, I'm going to go into DTs. I said, we're going to get you sober, and we're going to get you to treatment. We got him sober. He went back to Tennessee and he went to treatment. And a man has been sober ever since. Miracles in this program happen every day. And we are so privileged, I believe, to be able to be part of those miracles and to be able to see those miracles happen. My daddy celebrated 17 years sober this past August. He's a miracle in my life. The first baby he ever held was my daughter, and that's one of my favorite pictures of him. He said he never would hold anybody else's baby because he never got to hold me. And when we came home from the hospital, my daddy was there. And she, he was um, sitting on our bed holding my little Annabelle. There's so many miracles that have happened in sobriety. Um, I want to get to the next thing I want to share with you. My first sponsor, Gloria, um, I loved her to death. She, she absolutely saved my life. I remember the first time I ever worked the steps with her, um, us doing the fifth step. Uh, on the back porch of the Wild Grass Club. And I was terrified. You know how we hate the fourth and fifth step. Come on now, it's just rough. Um, and I'm a procrastinator, so I like to suffer a lot before pain and fear is a motivator and I go on and get it done. So I had been suffering. And um, so, you know, we do the fifth step and, and she hugs me after it's over and tells me she loves me and it's going to be okay. And it was one of my first spiritual experiences in this program. And then she killed the buzz. She said... What would you do if I go out tomorrow and get drunk? Now, we've just had this wonderful moment. I'm crying. I'm happy it's done. Thank God, you know. And now she's going to ask me, what would I do if she got drunk the next day? And my mouth's just hanging open like, I don't know. And she said, no, really, what would you do if I decided to go back out and get drunk? And I just looked at her. And she said, you'd go out and get another sponsor. And I said, okay. Because, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking she's my sponsor forever. Got around eight years sober, and um, Gloria wasn't coming around as much, and she decided to go back out and get drunk. And when I heard the news, I remember what she said. I had to find another sponsor. That was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. But I know that that eight to ten was another jump. It was another phase in my development, and I had to grow spiritually or die or go backwards. And, you know, I'm not one of those that believe in doing just the first three steps. I don't want to be a three-stepper. They are miserable in my opinion. I'm also not one of those that believes you do the steps once and you're done. That's not the way I was raised in this program. I'm a big old Vidalia onion. And every, every time I go through the steps, I peel another layer of that onion, trying to get down to the core of who my high power wants me to be. You know, that first layer of that Vidalia onion is just trash. It's brown. It comes off real easy. The next layer, uh, it's all right. But to get down a little deeper, boy, you really got to get that thumbnail in there. You got tears running down your face, and you're trying to get in there too. Okay? So I continue to work the steps in my life. I want to jump ahead a few years. Um, uh, I, I want to share one of the miracles in my life is my sweet husband, who is an earth person. Um, we talked on the phone for two and a half months before we ever saw each other. Uh, he worked night shift, and so our first date was after that two and a half months, and it was at 10 o'clock at night, uh, and we went out dancing. And uh, he orders a Long Island iced tea, and I order my spot. He has maybe two sips of that Long Island iced tea. Now, two things happened one night, that night. First thing was, we were dancing, and I asked him to marry you marry me. And he said, don't say things like that. You're going to scare me off. 
and, and the second thing that happened was I realized that there are no more drinkers out there. Heaven forbid. And that this might be one of them. I mean, I remember calling my sponsor on the way home saying, you ain't going to believe what he did. Now, nothing about anything else about the night. The first thing I had to say was, he owed a Long Island iced tea, and I don't even think he had two sips of it. He just left it there. That's alcohol abuse. The next day, and my husband's a cutie, the next day he called the four girls he was dating in three states and told them that he couldn't go out with them anymore, that he had found the one. And we've been together just about ever since. He's my soulmate and I love him. And I know to this day that God has brought him in my life and he's one of the miracles. I have a nine-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son that are just the apples of my eye and I love them. And, and Granny is a great granny. Um, when we moved to Montgomery, uh, it, it took me a while to find my home group happy hour. The day that I want to tell you about the day that I found her. Um, Mima, uh, my grandmother that helped raise me, had COPD and emphysema. And she wasn't doing good. Um, and we knew that it was slowly taking her life away. And that was really hard for me. And this April will be two years that she's been gone. Um, so on this particular day, um, Mima had been with me or Mama off and on. We were sharing her, and, and Mama had got her, and Mima had gone back. I had about 17 years sober, 17 and a half years sober. And, um, you know, and... She did so much for me. I am so thankful today that she got to see me sober and be a part of my life uh, and that I got to serve her in the way that she used to take care of me. So this was a really rough day, and Mima has gone back with Mama, and I'm sitting there thinking about I don't want to lose my Mima. I don't want to lose her. You know, the last time I had felt grief like this was when Big Mama had died, and I had went on a three-month binge, and I couldn't even hardly remember. And here I am at 17, 17 and a half years sober, with all this grief and I don't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden the thought comes to me, God, I sure could use a drink because I don't want to feel this. I don't do this very well. This is out of control for me. This hurts. I don't like this. And I'm a happy person. I don't like being like this. What do I do with this? Oh, when Dixie is right there, it's not even a mile from my house. It would take me but a minute to get in the car and go down there and bring me something back here and just get drunk. Oh, I want to get drunk so bad. I want to stop doing this. And all of a sudden, a plaque in my clubhouse flashed in my mind instantly. Think, think, think. We had them framed on our wall. Now, I was told to the newcomer, don't read that, and I never did. That's not for me. That was not for me. But on this day, it was for me. You know, I was told a long time ago, every AA meeting I ever go to is an insurance policy, and on this day it came. And I say, okay, God, I've had the first thing. I've thought about taking a drink. What's my second thing? What would I do? What would happen to me? I would lose my husband. I would lose my children. I would go out there and, and get drunk immediately. There's all kind of stuff out there I haven't tried yet. I don't know what a Zima tastes like or a Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> Oh, Lord, but God, it might take me to crystal meth or something else. And I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to leave my children. I don't want to die. I don't leave my husband. What do I do? And then it's time for the third thing. Amanda, you got to get on the phone. you got to call somebody right now. And I got on the phone and I called my sponsor. And she said, you get your butt to an AA meeting in Montgomery right now. And that's the day I found Happy Hour. And I walked in and that's the day I found my new little Miss Peggy, who was the same height as my old little Miss Peggy. And I found that group, and that group saved my life. And that group was with me in the grief. They carried me through. They carried me through. And I realized something in that process. And I'm going to share my analogy with you. It's one of my new favorite analogies. You know, I'm, I'm in Montgomery. I wasn't in Dothan and Enterprise. I had, I couldn't drive back and forth like I used to do when we first moved up there. I had begun to rest on my laws. And it talks about that in the big book. It talks about that. I wasn't calling my sponsor every day. I wasn't making a lot of meetings. I had these babies to take care of. You know, they take a lot of time. I had started a mothers of preschool group in my church. You know, I was busy. Busy, 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 busy. And here's what I know today. When I'm in the middle of my program, when I'm calling my sponsor as much as I need to, and especially when hell's breaking loose, when I'm making my meetings, 
when I'm working on my step, when I'm working with others, when I'm doing the things that I need to do, I have this big force field around me, okay? Some of y'all may have seen those Zorb balls that you can roll around in like a human hamster. That's, that's what my force field looks like. It's a big round ball. It's clear and it's shimmery and it sparkles because I like sparkly and bling. So it sparkles a little bit. So when I'm in the middle of my program, I've got that force field around me. Now, even when I'm in the middle of my force field, alcoholism is back there. It's a big six and a half foot cotton mouth rattlesnake. And it's rattles are back there rattling. And it's there. It's there all the time. It will never leave. Because my alcoholism will never leave. When I stop calling my sponsor, when I stop going to meetings like I should, I start getting cracks in my force field. And when that crack appears, that old sneaky snake gets a little bit closer. I'm not calling my sponsor. I'm not working the staff. I'm not reaching out to others. I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to do. I'm busy, busy, busy. I've got a big old crack in the middle of my force field. And that sneaky snake is right here beside me. And I know today when I was sitting on that couch in my in my living room, that day full of grief, that day that I found my home group, that snake was right here on my shoulder. My force field was gone. I had not done the things that I know to do. And that snake is a liar, and it was telling me things I wanted to hear. It was telling me that I'm not an alcoholic. I've got 17, 17 and a half years sober. I can go take a drink if I want to. I don't want to feel like this. You know you can cover it up with some alcohol. You know you want to go see what that Mike's Hard Lemonade tastes like. Thank God that God intervened on that day and put that plaque in my in my mind. So that as soon as I picked up the phone and called my sponsor, and as soon as I got my butt back to a meeting, whoosh, my force field is back up around me, and I'm protected from that disease of alcoholism over there. I'm going to share just, just briefly about... Um, I watched the with my mom, and then I'm going to close out my part and then, and then let Amanda close. You know, as a result of working the steps in this program, there are times in my life that something will happen, and I'll think, oh, that's why that happened when I was working that step, or oh, that's why that happened when I was working that step. Uh, and I think I have God figured out. But, you know, he helps me know over and over again that I don't have him figured out at all. When I was, when I was working the steps, one of the, I heard a speaker say one day, I was really struggling with making amends to my parents, particularly my mother, because she was a, an alcoholic that, that, that was quite abusive to me for, for much of my life, very abusive verbally and physically. And it was really hard for me to think about making amends to her. But I heard a speaker one day say that, that she had really uh, uh, some serious issues with her mother and that she had asked God to help her see her mother the way that God would see her mother. And so I took that to heart, and I did that with God, and I asked God to help me see my mother the way that he saw her. And, you know, it was totally, a totally different woman from the woman that I saw. And I was able to go to her, and I was able to make amends to her for the things that I had done to her with no feeling of resentment or anger or anything toward anything that she had ever done to me. And when she got sick and, and, and we had to start taking care of her, she would live with me a couple of weeks and a man a couple of weeks. We kind of just shuffled her back and forth. I thought, man, that's why I worked the steps and that's why I made amends to my mother because I could have never invited her into my home if I had not done that. And by then she was not able, she, she, my mother never got in recovery. Uh, she died not drinking because she was no longer able to get the alcohol and of course we didn't buy alcohol or have any. Um, so I thought, I could never have done this if it wasn't for me making amends to her. But one day, a few months before we died, we were talking, and we had never, we had never discussed the past. We had never talked about the abuse. We had never discussed any of that. And one day, we were in the house, and she started talking about that. And I said, I said, Mother, you don't want to go there with me. And I will, I will tell you, I was terrified on the inside. We were talking about the secrets. And it wasn't an hour on the room where I was safe. It was in, in my home with my mama, and she was talking about it. But she kept talking about it, and I said, you don't want to go there. And then she said, she said, well, you know, I didn't beat you every day. And I said, okay, we're there, mama. I said, no, you didn't beat me every day. But I said, one day was one day too many. And there were many, many days. And I looked at her sitting there, this frail woman, 
And I went over to her, and I got down on my knees, and I hugged her. I said, Mother, I want you to know that I forgive you. I said, I forgive every hit, every word. I forgive you. And I love you so much. And it wasn't long after that that she died. But you see, that's what this program has given me. It gave me love for my mother. It gave me the ability to see her as one of God's precious children, as we all are on this earth. There have been miracles after miracles that have happened in my life. And I just want to I just want to close by saying this. You know, sometimes people will come to our group and, and they'll say they'll say something something like this, which is what I'm sure I said when I first started going to Illinois. They'll say things like, Why is this happening to me? Why is God doing this to me? How dare God do this to me? I've been a good person. Why is God doing this to me? And I have to tell you, I say those same things. I say, why is God doing this to me? What have I done to deserve what God's doing to me? All these blessings, all this wonderful love and sharing and communion, all the miracles I get to see in the heart of who am I to deserve those blessings? Who are we to deserve those blessings? Because, you know, every one of us in this room are the chosen few. And I don't know about you, but I'm so overwhelmed with gratitude when I think about that. But I'm also so overwhelmed with responsibility. You know, it is my responsibility, just as I'm sure you feel like it's yours, to be that hand that pats a hand, to be that person that gives a hug, to be somebody when somebody says, will you sponsor me to say yes? to work my program so that I can help others work their program, and to be part of this lineage and this history that is so rich and is so vital to so many people on this earth. I want to thank you for being to families just like mine, what people were to me. And I want to thank you for being part of the miracle for so many people. And I'm going to let them make it happen. So many miracles because I chose to be willing to go to any lengths and because Mama chose to be willing to go to any lengths. You know, we're here today because she works her program to the best of her ability and I work my program to the best of my ability. Just a, a couple of more things I, I want to say is, you know, back in 89 I started a college uh, degree and this past December 16th I graduated with my college degree. Last night, Last night at my home group's business meeting, I got chosen to be the new chairperson to take meetings into that chart while I was And I started taking meetings in in two weeks. It's a miracle that Mom and I can ride in a car for nine and a half hours to a place like South Carolina to share our story. That's God doing for us that we can't do for ourselves. <laughs> We have a wonderful life today. We absolutely do. It's been hard work. We've got the scars and the claw marks to prove it. But it's been worth every single minute of it. And I wouldn't change it for anything. Mr. Bill, who had the boat that used to cart me everywhere, he died with 28 years sobriety. And on the day he, right before he died, he gave me his second edition big book that he had gotten in prison. And he marked this paragraph. And in it he wrote, he said, if you will abide by this, you will know true happiness. And a few years ago, a, a dear friend of mine pointed out that all 12 steps are in this one paragraph. I'd like to close with it today. The last paragraph on page 164. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your thoughts to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. My name is Amanda Brown. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you for letting me share.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.